the scripture reading is from Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. Uh, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night. For your servants, the people of Israel, I confess the sins we Israelites including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Thank you, Lenny. You are an inspiration to me. <laughs> Generally speaking, if you were to say that you were being used by someone, you would mean that in a negative context. That reference is often made in a romantic situation where someone is accused of, of using someone to make someone else jealous. Or you use someone by playing on their affections to get them to do something for you, like to advance in your job or social standing. It happens all the time. Or it may be more in a business setting, such as a pyramid scheme. A pyramid scheme is kind of a sketchy business model where a few top-level members recruit newer members. And those new members then pay upfront costs up the chain to those who enrolled them. And then as newer members in turn recruit uh, underlings of their own, then a portion of those fees they receive is also kicked up the chain. And so in a pyramid scheme, the major profit comes from the recruitment fees rather than the sale of the actual products. I won't name any of the actual companies, but uh, you have probably been approached by some of them uh, where they can make it sound so good and they can make a ton of money, but it all depends on how many people you use rather than how many products you sell. We don't like to be used. It makes us feel foolish and gullible if we were made to, to feel like we were valued and, and respected and even loved only to find out it was just all part of a scheme for someone else to, to further their own agenda. We've probably all been there, where we felt that we were just used by someone and then cast aside when they were done using us so that that person can just move on to what they really wanted to do once he or she was done with us. And so for me to stand up here and to tell you that God wants to use you, it may not sound all that appealing. No, let God use somebody else to further his agenda. I've got my own agenda to be concerned with. Some people may believe there is a God, but they don't want a part of him because they don't think his agenda is worth pursuing and certainly not something that they want to be used for. But let me tell you something. When you know God 
And you can know him through his son, Jesus Christ. When you know him and you gain just an inkling of understanding what his agenda is, then to be someone that he uses to achieve that agenda is the greatest privilege and honor you can possibly think of. If God can use me to bring glory back to himself, then he can use me all he wants. God wants to use you. He wants to use me. And it blows my mind to even think that God would choose to do that. He doesn't have to. He can accomplish anything he wants to any way that he wants to. He doesn't need us, but he wants to use us. And so it should be our goal then to be the kind of person that God can use. 2 Timothy 2.20 says this, In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes and some for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for, no for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Well, this seems to indicate that to be useful to the master requires certain qualities. To be used of God requires more than just being willing. And that's probably the most important component, of course, to be willing, but there must be more to it than just being willing. It doesn't matter if you're willing if you're not equipped. It doesn't matter if you're willing if you're not dependable. It doesn't matter if you're willing if you're not pure. And so that must mean that there are certain things that we must get rid of in our lives and certain things that we must be sure are present in our lives to be the kind of person that is useful to the master. The Bible's filled with stories of details uh, with uh, people who are greatly used by God. Uh, Nehemiah is one such person. Nehemiah is a story of an ordinary man, but who had an extraordinary vision. And he was able to overcome tremendous obstacles and to galvanize thousands of people to make that vision a reality. So today we're going to look at the one God uses in the example of Nehemiah. And as we look more closely at the passage that, that Lenny read for us, allow me to give just a, a kind of a short synopsis of the history of Israel up to the time of Nehemiah, in case you're not familiar with it. The Jewish race began with God's promise to Abraham back at Genesis. He says, I'll make you a great nation and I will bless you. The nation of Israel was small and pretty obscure until the time of David. Uh, but through the leadership of, of David, Israel became strong and very prosperous. David's son Solomon inherited the throne, but Solomon didn't remain faithful to God. God had promised Israel if they loved him and obeyed him that uh, he would bless their nation. But if they turned away, that he would judge them. Well, Israel did turn away from God, and they were judged by God. And this is how it happened. The army of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, raided Israel. Buildings and homes were destroyed. Jerusalem was devastated. The temple was demolished, and the great wall around the city was burned to the ground. Thousands of Jews were killed, and the rest were taken hostage. Imagine a people so evil to do that to the chosen people of God. Not too hard to imagine, is it? They were made to walk 800 miles to Babylon, and they were forced into slavery. Well, about 70 years later, Babylon was conquered by the Persians. The new king was kind, and he allowed a group of Jews, led by a man named Zerubbabel, uh, to make the trip back to Jerusalem. And when they arrived, they began to rebuild the temple. About 60 years later, a second generation of uh, in, in, enslaved uh, exiles, led by Ezra, well, was returned to Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah picks up the story about 14 years after that, after he received a visit from one of his brothers who had been in Jerusalem with Ezra's group. And he writes in, in uh, the first few verses of, of chapter 1 in Nehemiah, that in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Nehemiah asked about Jerusalem, but he didn't like the answer he was given. They told him that the wall of Jerusalem had been broken down and the gates had been burned, and this news upset him, and so he decided to do something about it. Nehemiah decided to rebuild the wall, and he did. So as we, we begin th this topic, the first question we need to ask is, what was it about Nehemiah that made him the kind of person that God could use to do such a great thing? Uh, this first chapter of Nehemiah shows us four characteristics of the, the kind of person that God uses. First of all, God uses people he can trust. If we skip down to verse 11, at the very end, we see that, that Nehemiah identifies himself by saying, I was a cupbearer to the king. 
So what does being a cupbearer have to do with being trustworthy? Well, the, the title itself might not sound all that impressive. It sounds like being a busboy or a waiter or something, but it was much more than that. The cupbearer was the one who tasted the king's wine before he drank it and, and tasted the king's food before he ate it. So if someone attempted to poison the king, it would be known by the death of the cupbearer. And so a strong friendship would often develop between the king and his cupbearer. The king knew that he could trust Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a, a loyal servant. When God needs someone to do a job for him, this is the kind of person he looks for. Some people might want to be used of God. They want to serve the Lord in different ways, but they're just not trustworthy. You can't depend on them to follow through with what they said they're going to do. We make the mistake of thinking that when you know, the big opportunity comes, then we'll jump in and, and we'll serve God with all we've got. But, but the fact is, if we can't be trusted to do little things with a spirit of excellence, then we won't get the chance to do the big thing. Jesus himself said in Matthew 25, 23, that you've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Now, God had made David to be king of Israel because he had proven himself to be faithful. It was David's responsibility to watch his father's sheep. He was just a shepherd boy, but he did it well. In fact, on several occasions, he risked his own life to protect his sheep. And so God knew that he could trust David to be the shepherd of his people Israel because David was a responsible shepherd boy. God knew that he could trust Nehemiah to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem because Nehemiah was a loyal and trusted servant. So God looks for people that he can trust. And you know what? Before this day is over, you're going to have several opportunities to prove your trustworthiness. You know, think about it. There's going to be various things that you will do to prove whether you're trustworthy or not. A lot of you have already done that today in your participation in this service. So God uses people he can trust. Secondly, God uses people with compassion. In verse 3 of our passage, it says, They said to me, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. Nehemiah was genuinely moved by what he had heard. Jerusalem, the city of God, had been stripped of all its glory. The once great and beautiful city was now in shambles, and this grieved Nehemiah. He hurt for his ancestors. He felt the pain of his countrymen. He had compassion. A man was flying back from Europe years ago and began talking to the elderly lady that was sitting next to him. Her name was Paulina, and she was from Poland. As they had been talking about families, Paulina mentioned that she had a son in Boston and a daughter in Israel. The man made a comment about Paulina being Jewish, and Paulina replied, I'm not Jewish, but my daughter is. Then she told the story. When the Nazis came to Paulina's village in Poland to round up the Jews to transport to the camps, no one knew what was happening, but everyone sensed something dreadful. The smell of death was in the air. Paulina was doing her weekly shopping near the train station on the day the Nazis arrived. Gestapo officers were pushing Jewish villagers onto the train. Paulina watched as one officer shoved a woman who had a little girl with her. The officer grabbed the Jewish woman and asked roughly, Is this your child? The woman stopped and, looking straight at Paulina, said, No, the child is hers. Paulina took that little girl by the hand, and together they watched the soldiers force the Jewish woman onto the train. The man sitting next to her on the plane said to Paulina, You mean you took this little girl to be your own? Paulina said, Yes. What else could I have done? God put Paulina in that train station on that day because he knew she had the compassion to do what needed to be done. There is so much that needs to be done in this world, in this church, in your community, in your family. But before you volunteer to do them, you must have that needed component of compassion for others. One of the most important ministries that we have as, as a church body is discipleship, where one person spends time on a regular basis with, with a new Christian in order to help them grow. This is how Jesus went about his ministry. It's the most effective way of building people into strong disciples. Right now, there are many people in our congregation who need to be discipled, and we need people who are willing to, to give up the time to train them to be strong Christians. It's kind of like finding a baby on our doorsteps. You know, how can our response be, you know, sorry, I'm too busy, I've got problems of my own? And we could say the same thing about just about any ministry that we have that we're currently conducting or should be conducting. 
We need people to, to visit those in nursing homes and, and sh uh, shut-ins and, and elderly and people in the hospital. We need people to, to work in Awana, helping kids learn verses and just spending time with them, enjoying them. We need people to teach Sunday school. We need people to help clean the building. We need people to help in the nursery. Now, pick any area and there are people that are needed to be there. If your heart is not moved with compassion over the needs of other people, then it will be hard for God to use you. But seeing what needs to be done compels you to get involved. Then you have what it takes to be used by God. Anthropologist Margaret Mead was once asked about what was the earliest sign of civilization in a given culture. Now you would think that the answer would be something like a, a fish hook or a, a clay pot or a grinding stone or something like that. But do you know what her answer was? A healed femur, a leg bone that had been broken and mended. See, when you think about that, a person with a broken leg could not hunt and gather for himself, and so unless there was someone to have compassion on him and to help him out until his leg healed, then he could not survive. There are no mended bones found in the ruins of an uncivilized people where the law of the jungle rules and only the fittest survive. But a healed femur reveals that there was compassion involved in that culture. I see they still show the the show Survivor. I don't know how many seasons it's been on. I watched the first one or two of them, and then I didn't waste any time on it. But I, I did draw a conclusion from it. That what an illustration of basic sinful human nature that that brings out, where a prize of one million dollars uh, will bring out that every man or woman for himself attitude. Something tells me if those people were forgotten and left there on that island a thousand years from now, that uh, evidence of their existence was uh, discovered that there would be no healed femurs there. That would have required compassion. Compassion is necessary to be a person that God can use. So in the work of the church or the home or anything that's really worth anything, there needs to be evidence of healing. In a terrible tragedy that took place in Maine this week, and after the body of the killer was, was finally found, then, then there began to be talk of healing that was necessary. And healing can't take place without the God using people to do that. Hurts have to be soothed, pain that once was can be removed, and there always hurts, there's always pain, there's always things that need healing. But that means when there's healing that God has been active and there's been real progress, and that compassion of human beings for one another is something that God used to make that progress happen. And it doesn't happen, but people don't have compassion. And then next, God uses people that are committed to prayer before Nehemiah did anything about rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, he made it a matter of prayer. He said in verse 4, For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah was serious about his prayer life. He not only devoted a great deal of time to prayer, but he prayed the right way. From the Lord's Prayer and other prayers that we find in the Bible, we learn what the model prayer should contain. And in Nehemiah's prayer in verses 5 through 11, we see that his prayer contained all those elements that, that make prayer complete. First of all, there, there was adoration. Verse 5, he says, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. He begins by acknowledging how great and how powerful God is. He acknowledges God's goodness and his faithfulness. He puts God in his proper place, so to speak, as ruler of all creation. And our prayers need to contain adoration when we pray to God for help. They also contain the component of confession. In verse 6, it says, Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave to your servant Moses. Nehemiah confessed his own sin and the sins of his nation. He acknowledged that it was because of Israel's sin that horrible things had come about. And we need to understand that God sometimes allows horrible things to happen to bring about compassion on his people. And we can uh, only think about this being what he's doing in Israel today. We received correspondence from Ephraim Goldstein, the representative from Chosen People Ministries that was here this last spring talking about Christ and the Passover. And he is now in Israel with, uh, with his organization. Jews for Jesus is there now. How we must pray for Israel during this time, not only that there be resolutions to this conflict, 
but that God would use this conflict to bring them to Jesus, their own Messiah. And, uh, and that's what God wants to do, and that is what God is going to do. Next, there was that component of intercession, starting in verse 8. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. God promised a place for his people to dwell. And that is the center of what is going on over there right now. But we, we pray for that, that people in that, that place that God has set aside. Nehemiah prayed on behalf of God's people, the Israelites. And then, in verse 11, we see the actual request, the petition. It says, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. He asked God to help him do what he, as a God's humble servant, wanted to do. And so to be used of God, you must be a person of prayer. I confess that I'm ashamed of how often I forget to really pray about the tasks of ministry. I often I'll say a prayer, and I'll sure be seeking the Lord's help in my endeavors, but I seldom truly turn to him in complete submission and remembering to, to pray in the completeness of this prayer that we see in the example of Nehemiah. What a difference there is when we remember to do that. So you who are involved in ministries in this church, please remember to do more than just say a token prayer before you begin your important work and remind me to do the same. And those who have an interest in, in being a part of the Lord's work and want to be used of God, please know how important it is not just to, to say a prayer, but to pray completely and to drench your efforts for the Lord with conversation with Him. Remember to praise Him for all He's done. Remember to acknowledge your shortcomings and pray for His grace and forgiveness. Remember to pray for others, and remember to have the boldness to ask God to do mighty things. To be used of God, this is a necessity. You must be committed to prayer. And then fourthly, God uses people who are ready to take action. In Nehemiah's petition to God, he said, Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. This man is referring to King Artaxerxes, who was the new king of Babylon, whom Nehemiah served as a cupbearer. And I, I like Nehemiah's reaction to the whole situation. He doesn't say, well, what can I do? No, I'm just one person. I live so far away. You know, somebody else is going to have to handle that. And he said, no, something has to be done, and I will do it. He was ready to take action. During World War II, General MacArthur asked an army engineer how long it would take to build a bridge across a river. Three days, the engineer said. MacArthur said, good, have your draftsmen make a blueprint right away. Three days later, MacArthur called the engineer to ask about the bridge. The engineer said, the bridge is ready. It's built. You can send your troops across it right now, unless for some reason you need a copy of the blueprint. The blueprint won't be ready for several more days. It might have been ideal to have the blueprint first and to work off the plans, but the important thing was to have a bridge, not the blueprints. Sometimes in the work of the Lord or in your family or in your job, things just need to be done even if there's no adequate preparation or training. Yes, it's ideal to have the blueprint. It's good to have a, a definite plan and a model for how things should be done, but you may not always have that luxury. I've heard some people say, well, you know, I don't really have an experience. I'm not very good at that, but, but I'm willing to work. If I see something that needs to be done, I'll be glad to do it. Well, that is a person who's ready to be used by God. That's the kind of person God can use one who has the desire to take action and to get things done. Yes, it's important to get proper training for the Lord's work or any other work for that matter, but it's more important that the work gets done. Willingness to, to work is only half the battle. It's a crucial component, but it's, it's important to be the one who responds like Isaiah did. Isaiah 6, 8 says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for me? And I said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 37, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. God's looking for people that he can use. There's no shortage of things to be done, but there is a shortage of those willing to do it. This is because serving God comes with a price. You must be trustworthy. You must be compassionate. You must be committed to prayer. 
and let's be ready to take action. If you have a desire to serve the Lord, there's a place for you right here at Spinning Road for you to serve. So jump in and start serving, and God will develop those qualities in your life to help you to be a better leader and a better servant in his kingdom. We're going to close in a, in a hymn before we have our quarterly business meeting, but if there's someone who would like to commit yourself, first of all, to the Lord, to ask to be saved from your sins, we're going to give you a chance to make that decision public. Or for somebody else who's ready to say, I, I want to be a member of Spinning Road and I want to jump in and help serve, you two are invited to come forward as we sing this song.